The MV world is full of narratives that I love to chew on and that interest me a lot because it's not just about the storyline itself, but it's also about the way fans perceive certain players, certain teams that make me question a lot of it. Throughout Mike Conley's basketball career, he's never been the number one guy. It's funny to look back on uh, because he did play with Greg Oden. Uh, they were childhood friends. Ever since high school, they played with each other. And then they went to the same college because Greg Oden thought that it would be better for him to go to the same college as his buddy Mike Conley. And it did work out for him in the beginning. He did end up getting the number one pick. And Mike Conley was the fourth pick. So, you know, pretty interesting tandem there that ended up uh, paying dividends in the draft. But after the draft, though, uh, things began to look very different for the two guys. And this video is not going to cover Greg Gordon's career. I think I'll do that at some point. But Greg Gordon is a player that has already been covered to death by YouTube channels everywhere. And I need to have an interesting angle to cover it. And I just don't have it right now. But Mike Conley though, he is a very interesting player. He's been a very consistent player. And that's something a lot of people talk about when they talk about how good Mike Conley is. He's very underrated. So much so that every time you meet somebody that knows about Mike Conley, they're going to tell you first that he's the most underrated player. Maybe of all time, maybe of this generation, I don't know. But they're going to say something along those lines. And what makes him a very interesting player is how he behaves not only on the court but off the court. He seems to have a very mellow personality to him. He seems to be very composed when it comes to him handling the ball in pressure situations. He has a knack for hitting clutch shots when you don't expect him to. And it's something that you clearly seen uh, when he played the Warriors in 2015. The Grizzlies were the second round opponents for the Warriors after they swept the Pelicans. And boy, did the Grizzlies make this series competitive. I mean, looking back, I thought the Warriors had an easy road to the championship in 2015, but nope, the Grizzlies made it competitive. They actually led the series at one point. And when you look back at the five year span that the Warriors have had, going to the finals each of those five years, there's only been one team that the Warriors have faced in the first or second round that they've trailed and it's the Grizzlies. It's really interesting to look at. And when you look at the first adversity the Warriors faced in the playoffs, it was that Memphis Grizzlies team. Game one of the series was an easy win from the Warriors. And at that point you'd think, well, the Grizzlies were in trouble because Mike Conley, if you don't remember, had an orbital fracture in his eye. So he had bigger problems than losing a series against the Warriors. Look, he was going through it at that point, so much pain that you must have to have had surgery to try and repair that fracture and Conley ended up going through it and powering himself to play in game two at Oracle Arena. It was spectacular. One of the greatest playoff performances coming from a player that had to deal with such a serious injury. It, it, it was really spectacular. So much so that you have Tony Allen calling him One-Eyed Charlie. What a badass name, by the way. Holy snap. And being a very skilled floor general that is always composed, he was able to also give Marc Gasol and Zebo, the best players of the team, their touches. And it was marvelous to watch. The Warriors were struggling to contain those two. And it was obvious that Andrew Bogut was not going to cut it. Look, the Warriors' success is primarily due to how they play on both ends with the undersized lineups they usually play with. On the offense, of course, you have Curry and Thompson leading the way, just lighting it up from all cylinders. And then on defense, you got guys like Iguodala and Draymond Green coming in clutch. And then Steve Kerr, of course, wraps it all around with his scheming on both ends. It just created a juggernaut of a team. But Memphis, they highlighted something that the Warriors still struggle with to this day. And that is playing against bigs that are so dominant on both ends, okay? You have Marc Gasol being DPOY, of course, in 2013. 
and then you have Zebo. I mean Zebo's post up game. I mean this guy is going to cook you and there's nothing you can do about it. That's just how good he was. I mean they had some good guard play with Courtney Lee being a good shooter and then Ben Udrick being a nice backup point guard to have at that time. Uh, but I think one thing that made it that much better for the Grizzlies was Tony Allen, of course. Uh, first team all defense, okay? There's no doubt about it. He was that guy. And his defense on Clay was instrumental in them uh, getting that win a game free. It, it, it's just that series really did highlight some of the Warriors' weaknesses. And it led me to think about something that was so exciting at the time when I thought about it. But before I get into that, I have to clear up some confusion. I know some people are wondering where this channel is headed. I don't have that many subscribers, so I didn't think to let you guys in on the things I'm doing right now. But I've been struggling to make these videos for you guys because on the one hand, I love basketball. But on the other hand, I'm just feeling like an imposter half the time because I'm not as smart as guys like Funky and thinking basketball is just another level of intelligence in the basketball sphere. I just... I'm not that guy so I just I'm trying to carve myself a space where I can talk about certain narratives certain storylines in basketball because that's what draws me to the NBA that's what keeps me coming back to watching basketball it's like anime for me what I watch the shows that deliver on the storylines I really do I just ingest that like it's a drug it's amazing so if you like stuff like that consider subscribing I, I'm gonna try to push these out once a week twice a week even the goal really is to push these out every day but i'm not there yet i have to get better at this craft now back to the main video i had what if there was a team that was constructed with a similar foundation as the grizzlies were and you refine some parts some parts you know you don't inherit directly but there is a certain thing about the team that leads you to think well if you just nabbed one of their players, say Mike Conley, you could hypothetically match up well against this worst team. <laughs> and yes, I think you guys know where I'm going with this, the Utah Jazz. Although they don't have that special low post offensive threat in Zebo, they do have a defensive player of the year caliber player like Rudy Gobert. Yes, Rudy Gobert, I don't care what you think about him, he is the hands down the best defender of this generation. He is, without a doubt, the best run protector. And he is, <laughs> you can miss me with him being a horrible permanent defender, okay? No, the problem with that Clipper series wasn't that he was a horrible permanent defender. It's that the Utah Jazz were relying so much on his godlike defense that they were stretching him way too thin. And you could see it with the amount of space given to Gobert to try to cover when Terrence Mann was open for those frees, when Beverly was even open. And of course, you want Beverly to shoot those, but you have to have five men playing defense. You can't have one guy running the whole defensive schemes. And I think Quinn Schneider, he knows this. I think the whole team knows this. And Donovan Mitchell, credit to him, man. He said it himself, he needs to be better on that, de on that defensive end. He needs to be way better than he is at the moment. And when you look at the statistics he's been putting up this season, 1.7 steals a game, career high in steals. You have him besting his career high now in deflections and now besting his career best in opponent three point shooting field goal. I mean, this is the most engaged we've seen Donovan Mitchell on that end and it's very great to see. And you pair that guy up with Mike Conley who we all know how great of a defender this guy can be. Okay, we know how great of a defender and the missing piece here has to be Quinn Schneider implementing a scheme on defense that doesn't stretch Rudy Gobert thin. So you can forget about players like Anthony Edwards, Patrick Beverly, and Marcus Morris that try to downplay how good this team can play on defense and really trying to say that you know either Rudy Gobert isn't really a DPOY because he doesn't guard the best player or Rudy Gobert is good but the rest of the team just sucks. I mean they're just very bad. The amount of slander people have been throwing at the Jazz, it's insane. It's really insane. They're the most disrespected team that is at the top of the conference right now. And unlike the Grizzlies, what really makes the difference for this team is their offense. Their offense is so prolific. They have the best offense in the league right now. Best offensive rating, most points per game as a team. I mean, their offensive rating is four points higher than the second place team. I mean, that's just insane. 
not long ago they were the only team in the top five in offense and defensive ratings now it's the warriors that claims this title but the utah jazz defense is still at a very good sixth place in the defensive rating category their defense is there right the offense is just another level it's just insane the best team the warriors have ever faced in the western conference the houston rockets they have to be one of the best offensive teams in history and what really pushed them to potentially make it to the finals in 2018 was Chris Paul handling the ball and we saw how pivotal it was when he missed those last two games and it's funny now that one of the two teams in the Western Conference that I think and that many others think can give the Warriors problems are teams that either have Chris Paul or Mike Conley being the floor general and it's interesting to see that the Warriors have played the Jazz in the past in 2017, but that was a team that was led by Gordon Hayward at the time, and Donovan Mitchell was not in the NBA yet. And so you could see now a different looking Utah team facing this Warriors team, I think it's going to be a very compelling series. I think it's going to be up there with the Warriors Rockets series in 2018 and the Warriors Cavs series in 2016. I don't see how this series doesn't go seven games, okay? And they have not even played a single NBA game this season yet against each other. It's insane. It's funny. The Phoenix Suns are about to play the Warriors for the third time on Christmas Day. And meanwhile, we have to wait until the year 2022 to see these two teams play each other on January 1st. I honestly do think the Warriors have never seen a team as complete as the Jazz. They are as complete as can get on both ends. And if the Utah Jazz were to play the Warriors, I really do think there is some good money to be had if you were to bet on the Jazz. I really do think that. By the way, this video was made in late December. Um, the Warriors, if they did acquire a Sabonis or a Miles Turner, God forbid that happens, we're in a world of trouble and I'm not so sure how my take is going to age because I'm not sure if the Warriors are going to go full out to try to get a player like that. It would be so unfair if this were to happen. Please let it not happen. We cannot have this monstrosity being unleashed on the basketball world. Oh, and how could I forget to conclude this video? I, I'm so sorry, guys. Um, Mike Conley, this is the stars aligning themselves, okay? The Warriors and the Jazz. I think it's going to happen guys. If the playoffs were to start as of the time I'm recording this video, the Warriors and the Jazz would play each other in the second round and I'm, I'm really sure, I'm really convinced in my heart of hearts that that's going to happen. Mike Conley has been trying for years now to lead his team to the NBA Finals and the Warriors have been one of those teams like the Spurs that have stopped him in his tracks. The OKC Thunder 2012 did the same thing and it's funny that years later down the line in 2022. He may have his best shot at making it to the finals. I think this is his best opportunity. I think the Warriors are going to be the one team that they're going to have to beat. And of course, I'm pretty confident that they will because of the matchup problems the Warriors have with Biggs. And because of how prolific this offense is, Mike Conley being such a composed floor general, there's so much there that gives the Utah Jazz the edge to beat this Warriors team. And I know people are going to say it's an upset for a reason because the Warriors are much better than them and they've shown with a better track record of making the finals for five straight years and I'll give you that if the Utah Jazz were to beat the Warriors it would be an upset it would be on all metrics but the stars are aligning folks Mike Conley's final chapters in the NBA world is going to be written and we'll see whether or not he's able to achieve a feat that very few point guards in the league have ever been able to do so like you said at the end of the day like you look back at it and it's like, man, I, you know, that was our chance. And uh, you're just hoping to get that chance again.